Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Kate Rivera. I am a consultant working with the Technology Learning Collaborative, and we're really excited to be partnering today with the Digital Inclusion Practitioners of New Jersey to co-host this webinar. Uh, and um, also joining us is uh, Angela Seifer from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. We're really excited to bring these groups together um, this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, we are recording this webinar and we'll be posting it on the Technology Learning Collaborative's YouTube channel so that uh, folks who couldn't make it today can still benefit from the information. And we'll also be sharing out uh, the slides that we're sharing today with everyone who registered for the event. So if there's information in the slides that uh, you will find useful, we will be sending those out for you. I, just quickly, our agenda for today, and I, and I do want to note that this event is uh, a part of National Digital Inclusion Week. Um, so uh, also an exciting time, and hopefully you've been following some of the social media chatter. There's a lot of events happening all over the country, um, and you know it's exciting to, um, as we all do this work, to bring more attention to these issues. So today we're just going to um, hear briefly from the Digital Inclusion Practitioners of New Jersey about their organization um, and a little bit about the Technology Learning Collaborative in Philly, uh, and then really turn things over to um, Angela from NDIA to um, chat with us about a few the national and, and local trends, and um, we'll also have time for your questions and for some conversations today. So I am going to uh, turn things over to Andrew from the Digital Inclusion Practitioners of New Jersey. Hey everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, my name is Andrew Fairley, and I am the chair and co-founding member of Digital Inclusion Practitioners of New Jersey. If you don't like saying lots of words, you can also call us Dip NJ. It's much easier. Um, uh, yeah, I just want to give you some background on Dip NJ and sort of the the context and um, the state of digital inclusion in New Jersey. Uh, we are a relatively young digital inclusion coalition. Um, and like all coalitions, I, I assume we exist to galvanize uh, relationships between individuals seeking to close the digital divide in our state. And essentially we do this because uh, we believe that a series of siloed um, efforts chipping away at that huge problem that is the digital divide is both less effective and also less desirable than uh, working together to build a culture and framework of digital inclusion in the state. And so we were born out of an event put on by the Jersey City Housing Authority back in summer 2019, uh, where we brought together a bunch that uh, they, excuse me, I wasn't part of that, um, I attended. Uh, they brought together a bunch of stakeholders in the area, which was largely staffed from nonprofits and uh, municipal bodies, uh, libraries, housing authorities, um, both in Jersey City and the surrounding area. Um, if you know anything about northern New Jersey, you know that Newark and Jersey City are very, very close to each other. And like, um, and New Jersey is just a series of very, very close, relatively small to large cities. Um, and at that event, there was uh, so much, you know, excitement and learning and resource sharing that we decided that we didn't want that magic to end once everyone left the building that day. So um, the person who was running that, uh, Michael Strom, and I co-founded Dip and Jay. Uh, we worked together for a few months, getting um, gathering information, gauging interest. Um, through that, we got a lot of help from both TLC Philly and NDIA slash their listserv. And uh, when we had our first meeting, we felt extremely solid because of that, that um, collaboration and all that help that we received. Um, and from our first meeting, we planned to build up slowly, but that was in February of 2020. So in March of 2020, um, all of a sudden, everyone started to really care about digital inclusion all of a sudden. And so we hit the ground running. Uh, we did a bunch of explaining of how uh, all things digital uh, sort of affect every aspect of a person's life and how we could begin to address that issue. 
And so for some state context, um, New Jersey has the dubious distinction of being one of, I believe, just four states without a state level broadband plan, either in existence or currently in the works. Uh, it has four of the top 50 spots in NDIA's Worst Connected Cities report for no broadband. Uh, those cities are Newark, Trenton, Camden, and Elizabeth. And we have five of the top 50 spots for no wireline access uh, in that same report, Newark, Trenton, Camden, Elizabeth, and Passaic. Um, in addition to all of this, in March of this year and several times since, our governor keep, has stated that, quote, uh, as of with this, when he first said this, uh, quote, as of today, New Jersey's digital divide is no more. It has been closed and has repeated that sentiment multiple times, which is, of course, not true. Um, but it is pretty indicative that at the state level, the understanding of what the digital divide is and what digital inclusion is, um, or that there's, there, there's a lot to be desired there. And so that's what we're trying to ultimately affect. Um, we are trying to change the understanding of what DI, a digital inclusion is so that we can seriously address the issues surrounding it, uh, both on a micro level and on a macro level. And we do this by workshopping digital inclusion issues, uh, building this network of digital inclusion practitioners and stakeholders, um, sharing informational resources across that network, um, reiterating over and over again to friends and family that everything is a digital equity issue. Um, and when possible, we also try to do a bit of ad advocacy work, uh, but we hope to do more of that in the future. And so that's mostly what I have to say for the intro, but before I leave you, I just wanna say two things. One, I wanted to, we wanted to thank uh, Kate and Andy from uh, TLC Philly and Angela and the whole NDIA team. Um, again, when we started this, started working on this about two years ago, both were incredibly instrumental in um, helping us not flail around um, or minimize the flailing that we did. And um, yeah, we're just extremely excited to, to hear the presentations today. Um, the final thing is that tomorrow we are holding our annual symposium. Uh, we'll have State Senator Teresa Ruiz um, speaking on the on her digital inclusion efforts in the state. Uh, she's one of the main digital inclusion champions for us. And uh, we'll have Ronald Chaluzian Batil, uh, who's the executive director of Newark Trust for Education. And he'll be talking about the need to maintain the sense of urgency uh, around closing the digital divide as we continue to live through, through COVID. Um, you can sign up at dipnj.org slash events. And I'll also put the Eventbrite page in, in the chat. Otherwise, um, you can reach us at dipnj.org or digitalinclusionnj at gmail.com. And uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Andrew. <clears throat> uh, next up, uh, we're going to share a little bit about the Technology Learning Collaborative. And uh, Andy Stutzman, our board chair, is going to start us off. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is great to see, all the, seeing all these faces I recognize in the list. It's great. It's, um, I always feel like I'm home when I see people, see people I know here. <laughs> but uh, TLC, yeah, we've been around for, we're in our ninth year, I believe. This this month would have actually been our ninth annual conference, I believe, if we had been, been able to do it, uh, as we typically do. But we're hoping this can take place with that for this year. Um, but yeah, we are, we, we, we've been around for a while, since the eight, nine years. And we drive the digital literacy access and inclusion conversation in Philly. That, that's kind of our big goal, um, by promoting that professional collaboration and training and networking among organizations. Um, we have over 300 members right now, and which is, which is just tremendous as well. And that includes individuals and um, also um, organizations too that we work closely with. And we're mostly focused on digital li literacy programming, media literacy, career and educational training, like work and workforce. Um, and then technology access as well. So th that's not everyone's primary focus, but that is a de definite focus of all the different members that we have and organizations we work with. So we, we emerged out of the BTOP program that through the city of Philadelphia, um, which was a combination of a couple of BTOP grants that really brought it in together that all the different nonprofits and CBOs along with the city as well set up 77 different key spot or computer labs 
um, who are publicly ac accessible throughout the city. And through that, that work, um, there was over 200,000 hours of digital literacy training provided and 5,000 5, households were able to get connected to the internet. And we're all, we're, we've been volunteer led this whole time, um, which has just been tremendous that we've been able to keep this up throughout the years as a volunteer led organization. And we've also been privileged um, the last year in 2020 that we wrote a small proposal to Comcast for $25,000 to help us become a nonprofit, right? And that's gonna be, I think in our, our recent updates here. Yep, I'm jumping ahead of the game here. Oh. So yeah, we, we were, but through Comcast support, um, we were able to hire Kate who has been involved in the digital inclusion initiatives here since the beginning with us. Um, and she helped us become a legally incorporated entity. So we are an official business with the state of Pennsylvania and we have a, our, a full board now. Um, mostly full board so we just we just actually uh, agreed for two new board members this last week which is great and we are just now waiting for our full 501c3 status and um, with that we hope to be able to to apply for additional grants um, and get some more funding out there to really kind of uh, promote the work that we're doing here and yeah right now we have launched a strategic planning and growth phase and received a grant to grow training and capacity building supports and that that is really around um, providing digital inclusion 101 trainings to different organizations around the city and you know, basically helping people understand what is the layout of what does digital inclusion mean? You know, what is what is the state of Philadelphia, you know, right now getting helping them realize that and also realizing them as their starting programs that meet that work with community members and organizations and community members. What are the kind of questions you need to be asking and in, in, around Internet access around device access and what are these what are the assumptions you should make? And then also building capacity building as well. So reaching out to more organizations and, and kind of really growing our network too. And with the strategic planning, you know, we sent out a survey um, to our group. And this is kind of the, the word cloud of the, the more you know, things that really stood out to people. Um, obviously being a resource for people, uh, them to contact us, we can reach out to our network of folks and someone's gonna know the answer to a question or have done something before that we can help someone with. So you can see that resource network, uh, the information, um, the collaboration, those are, the, those are the kind of the key words that are coming out of our, our, our planning and our, um, our goals right now. And then just a, a little bit about um, the future and what we've been thinking, as Andy said, we, we've gone through sort of a mini strategic planning process and building on a lot of the work that's already been done. We did a survey of our members and talked to a lot of different stakeholders and sort of emerging out of that uh, is really our sort of three, three pillars um, that we're really looking to focus on moving forward and really building on a lot of the work that's already been done. So the first is that we're uh, information and resource sharing hub. Uh, which is already we have our listserv, we're doing these webinars, and we're really looking to also expand out that work. We've heard from um, members that it's, you know, we've heard from a lot of folks actually about how important it is to really think, really get a better understanding for, for everyone of the full digital inclusion ecosystem in Philadelphia, where there are gaps, where we can provide additional supports, um, as well as, you know, ways for, organizations to refer clients and make sure that individuals have a, um, a, a pathway and a ladder to, to further um, their skills and get the resources that we need. Second pillar is around professional development and capacity building. So as Andy was just talking about, um, really expanding out the trainings and capacity building supports that we're able to provide to organizations uh, both organizations that don't really focus on digital inclusion, like social service organizations that you know don't really have this as a focus, or community groups who um, you know they don't focus on this work, but they know that the the community members and clients that they work with need access and need skills, uh, and so helping them understand what the resources are that are available um, to those folks, um, as well as providing more uh, capacity building for organizations that are already doing this work uh, to some extent are looking to get into this work so that they're able to um, really build off of the work that's already been done and not reinvent the wheel and start from ground zero if they're looking to launch a new program or, or develop new curriculum. 
And the, the final pillar is really building a community of practice. Uh, so we will, we will be in the very near future, we've already kind of soft launched a Slack community uh, as a place for folks to gather and share um, you know, events, resources, ask questions, best practices, all those kinds of things. So we'll be um, launching that out to the full with all of our members uh, very soon as an additional place you can go to to connect with other people who are doing this work. Um, and really, you know, focusing on you know, bridging the silos, um, helping organizations see opportunities for collaboration, um, and helping to support those kinds of efforts. Um, so that is um, just a little bit about um, who TLC is and, and what we're thinking about for the future. Um, and with that, we will turn things over to Angela from NDIA. I'm going to end the presentation here. So Angela, the floor is yours. Great. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> it's really super to be here with you. Uh, okay, so I have lots of things I could cover. So I'm going to cover some things I think that are useful to you. And then we're just going to have a discussion. That way we can hit everything you wanted me to cover and I did cover. <laughs> so um, so real quick, I'm Angela Seifer. I'm the Executive Director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. I live in Columbus, Ohio, and um, I've been to multiple TLC meetings. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you today. Uh, we started NDIA about seven years ago because there wasn't an entity that represented digital inclusion folks on the ground so there wasn't a voice for the programs that you work in to be influencing public policy or to be uh, changing how people view this issue and now we are that we are that entity and we take that very seriously that you are the ones doing the hard work you are the ones on the ground you are the ones changing people's lives we are not doing that and so it is our job to make sure we're supporting you as best we can and we do that through peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking. So a lot of uh, uh, discussion on the listserv, as has already been mentioned, the listserv can be a bit active. So if you need to digest, just <laughs> change the way it comes into your inbox. Uh, but it is really a community, right? So it's a place to ask folks questions. If you're working on something and you need some advice from practitioners who've maybe been in the same spot that you're in, that's the perfect place to do it. We have monthly community calls. They used to, during the height of the pandemic or the beginning of the pandemic, we were doing them weekly. Uh, that was quickly killing us. So now they're monthly. Uh, so that is also a place to bring some questions if you have a new resource that you're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Whether you created it or somebody else created it and you're like, everybody should know about this thing because it's really great, say so, right? And then we might be able to go find whoever created it or you may know who created it and we can have them share that out with other folks. Uh, let's see, working groups. Another way to engage with NDIA is our working groups. Probably should have looked up the date. Five or six years ago, we created a coalition, building coalitions guidebook. Uh, we had five coalitions that were on this working group that were basically telling us what they were learning um, in building their coalition. And Philadelphia was one of the coalitions, TLC was one of the coalitions that taught us what they were doing. And so we are now at a spot where it's time to update that guidebook. Uh, so there's a working group that uh, Mooney Ray Jester, one of our folks has just started. And so if, um, you'll, if you haven't heard from her, you will be soon. Uh, and and that, that working group is both to inform the development of this guidebook, but also, there needs to, because coalitions, I mean, you guys are the perfect example as you have the two of you, two coalitions in one space, the need to share, like, hey, what are you doing on this? What are you doing on this? How is your structure? Uh, do we want to become a 501c3? I don't know, like hearing hearing what TLC's experience has been, is that a good idea? Is that know, like pros and cons, right? Um, and so that kind of discussion is needed now. And I, I would say when we created that guidebook, with those five, there were, oh, by the way, we only there were only five coalitions we asked about because there were only five coalitions. Right? It's not like there are a whole bunch that we could have gone to for advice. That was it. TLC was one of the first. 
So um, that's changed. Now we know of over 30 coalitions that are, we think of them as place-based, right? It's a region, it's a metro, it's a county, uh, it's a city, but it's a place-based coalition where folks are talking about digital equity and figuring out how to get out those solutions together. The, uh, the new thing that we've started trying to wrap our heads around is the idea of a strong digital inclusion ecosystem. And so by that, we mean that all the members of your coalition and other folks who are part of the programs that um, provide digital inclusion services, how are they interacting together? Um, when do folks you know, recommend services that aren't inside their own organizations to other places? What, what does that ecosystem look like? So we're in kind of introductory beginning stages of understanding what makes a strong ecosystem. Uh, and I think that's that's a newer thought that's even possible because of the awareness that the pandemic brought for all of us on this issue. Um, you know, funding people, every everything. Uh, okay, so other things that we have on our website that may interest you. Uh, digital navigators, we create a digital navigator model. Well, we created it in cooperation with our members um, and we wrote everything up uh, that we could find. Uh, there's a, we, Paulo just did a fabulous webinar last week around the digital navigators model. Uh, so that is all publicly available. So those, I know some of you are already working on that and others who have interest in it, it is all there. And we do it the same way we've done everything else, which is hearing what's going on, on the ground. I think a slight difference for us in this case is that because we were involved at the beginning with helping figure out what that model looked like, we do now have consulting services around that, um, which is probably a good point. I should describe NDIA's finances. So uh, when we started NDIA, we had zero dollars and Bill and I weren't getting paid. Uh, we're getting paid now. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> We've fixed that one. Uh, and we're now up to, up to a team of 12. Uh, so that is a mix of uh, grant funds from different foundations, but also it is fee-for-service work. So as we're able to make sure that any fee-for-service work meets our mission, right? We only take it on if it meets the mission and if it has a broader purpose. So for example, with the digital navigators work, we now only take in the digital navigators work where we're going to learn something. It's a different situation that we can then spread out wider. Uh, so we are pretty careful about that. Um, federal update. This is the last thing and then we're going to open up for discussion. So federally, folks, I've never seen so much money. Like really, uh, it's a little astounding. Um, so we've had the multiple stimulus packages, right, where there was money that could be used for digital equity uh, and in many places was used for digital equity. And then in the, with the ARPA funds, we're now at where local and state governments are still spending down their money from ARPA. They can be used for digital inclusion work. And then the, guide, the guidance for the um, uh, capital funds just came out a couple weeks ago. Uh, Vicki, would you grab that link for me, please? I should have had that ready. Um, I think it's the second to oldest link on our blog posts. Um, Vicki's our newest. This is her first day. Everybody wave to Vicki. Yay! <laughs> Senior programs manager. And she's like, what? What does Angela want me to do? Uh, sorry, I should have given her a warning. So, um, so our policy director, Amy Huffman, wrote up, what, did the, what does this capital projects money mean to folks like you, like you all? And so there's the blog post itself like lays it all out. But the short version is that the states and territories and tribes, everybody's getting some money in this capital funds. Uh, the word assets is really important. They have to spend money on assets. They have to spend money on things, physical things. The physical things include Wi-Fi and computers. So if you can get your state to do so, to pay for, to cover a project uh, where there's some computers being purchased or some Wi-Fi equipment being purchased, you can add on ancillary services of digital literacy or digital navigation. So I think that's probably the most important thing to know about that money. Um, the, well, the second most important thing is that the states are deciding how the money's spent. The trickier part is that it's we don't know who in each state is going to control those purse strings. So you're gonna have to do some asking around, but it's significant enough 
ask around, right? Make yourselves known that you want to know the answers and whoever has those answers, invite them to a meeting. Would they like to share with everybody what their process is? Would they like to hear what you all are doing because you are the projects that they should be funding with this money? Uh, so that's like the here and now money. And then there's the money we're expecting. Everybody, please, please like whatever, whatever prayer you may have or crossing your fingers or uh, we believe in unicorns at NDIA. So whatever it is, um, the federal government, when they finally get around to, when Congress finally gets around to passing that broadband infrastructure bill, there is 2.75 billion with a B for digital equity. That is just astounding. Like just, if you hadn't already heard that, just let that soak in for a sec. Um, because that's, that's the work you all do. And the language in there, it's all, it'll all look familiar to you, right? Because it came from digital equity practitioners is where that language came from. It started in Seattle, went through a bunch of other folks. Uh, so it is, it is language that you're like, oh yes, this is what we do. Uh, and that money will go to the states. The states will need to create a digital equity plan. This is another reason to be BFFs with your state broadband offices. I'm sorry, Andrew, that you guys don't have them broadband office, uh, figure out who's in charge of broadband money, because they're getting money, even if there's no office, somebody's in charge of the money, right? So, so figure out who's, who's in charge of the money. And, you know, this is the kind of serious kind of situation. Uh, I would figure out what coffee shop they go to. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's how much money we're talking about. You really want to become friends with these people. And, and it is, um, it's the kind of thing where, so they, the states need to create a digital equity plan and you'll wanna be engaged in the plan, of course. And then the states will have implementation money and then the money should go to whatever the plan is focusing on, right? And then there's gonna be additional money that NTIA manages that is the um, competitive funds for that. And so then, it, so then in, in addition to the Digital Equity Act, in the broad in the infrastructure package is also um, more money for emergency broadband benefit, uh, which should should help um, because then we won't worry so much about it ending at some unknown date, which is our current situation. We would have a more clear, at least it'd be you know four or five years out, so we wouldn't have to worry as much. We could really get folks on that emergency broadband benefit with less concern. Um, there's there's language in there around, it was supposed to be digital redlining. It's, um, they're calling it uh, digital discrimination. You wanna guess who got that kind of watered down a little bit? I'll just leave that to your imagination. Uh, and then um, there's also language around, um, around uh, the, the idea that there needs to be broadband um, labels on all the services that we are purchasing. Labels that you can more clearly compare from one service to another. Uh, there's, there's, there's just a lot, right? So um, when, let's all be very positive, right? When Congress passes the infrastructure bill, NDIA's job is to interpret that for you. So you don't have to go read the whole thing. Uh, and and we, will, we do that on the blog post, we do that. You'll see it come through the listserv and you'll see it in, um, in the, we'll talk about it nonstop. You'll get tired of it on the community calls. Okay, let's have a discussion. Questions, thoughts, things you think Vicki and I should know. One question I'll start. I'll stretch you off, Angela. Um, is around computer distribution. We know that the Christina Foundation really stepped up and helped organize that nationally. Um, what do you see? How do you see the future of that working out, um, especially with especially with funds coming from the infrastructure bill? Yeah, that's a super good question. So yes, National Christina Foundation is now Digitunity. If you haven't checked out their website, highly recommend that. Um, Vicky, can you grab that link too, please? Digitunity's website. I think this goes to that question of what does a strong digital inclusion ecosystem look like? Where is a continuous source of free or low cost computers for the community to purchase or that are being distributed? 
And so this is a systems kind of change, right? And so some communities are going at this in a, well, let's bring in a refurbisher. Uh, prior to the pandemic, the Cleveland Foundation, just like a year prior to the pandemic, Cleveland Foundation had brought PCs for people to set up a new location in Cleveland. Pandemic hits, I live in Columbus, Ohio. Do you wanna know what folks in Columbus, Ohio were doing? They were driving to Cleveland <laughs> because Cleveland had PCs for people and Columbus didn't or they were getting PCs for people to bring their truck down so we could load up computers to be refurbished and then drive them to Cleveland to get refurbished and then bring them back again because we didn't have that kind of resource like Cleveland had. So I think that kind of change where it does, a, does every community need a refurbisher? Good chance. Like it's not my job to say yes, but it's something definitely to look at. Um, or is there, is it, having another place where low cost computers can be purchased on a recurring basis. The computers thing is, is a great example when you're explaining to people that there will always be a new digital divide. You could totally close the computer divide today and get everybody a brand new speaking computer. And in a couple of years, they're all out of date. So, so you have like, we are, ne our job is never done. Yeah, we're seeing right now we're seeing in our digital navigator programs, but 90% of our calls are about computers. So, so yeah. that's actually, so that's super fascinating because that's the same yeah. thing that we were getting in Salt Lake City. Most of the questions were about computers. Um, in the uh, toolkit that Salt Lake City and NDIA created for about their digital navigators program um, are some great stats about what's happening in Salt Lake City. And that's one of them. Yeah, I think Columbus just needs a nice, University there, like Drexel and Temple, that can do a lot of this work. I'm not sure if there's one around there, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> Angela, I'm oh, hi, Joan. I have a question. Hi, um, we're working in a rural community, and we have a digital literacy effort that we're running. And one of our thoughts was because our state doesn't have a digital navigator office, that the libraries might be the best place to position a digital navigator yes um, and that that's something every state has what's your thought what are your thoughts on that so there are states that where that's in development um new york state library is um they're not creating a program they are setting they've set up a structure whereby ndia is providing guidance to the libraries in case they would like to create a digital navigator program so they're not creating it themselves, but they've created a structure around such that there's money and there's support from NDIA for local libraries and regional libraries to develop digital navigator programs and, and other digital inclusion programs in general. Connecticut is developing a state digital navigator program from their state library. Wonderful, okay. Angela, can I stay uh, with digital navigators for a second? Uh, because it's a, it's a fantastic trend um, and you guys were there to either start it or help nurture it along. Um, what, in the time since you put your toolkit together, what kinds of organizations have you seen that make good navigators, folks that weren't in the space before? Right. Um, so, you know, I, I joke with my friends at TLC, remember last year when we thought the biggest problem of the year was going to be uh, census participation, and then the pandemic hit, right? But the folks who went door to door for the census could be good navigators. Who who are who are making good na navigator organizations? The organizations that are trusted by the community members that you most want to reach. Trust is the biggest barrier. Um, it can be the org often if there's if there's um, any uh, languages other than English being spoken, those are the languages where you want to make sure your navigators are fluent, right? Preferably even first language. Um, the places where there are other services being offered, so they are accustomed to the um, the kindness, the culture of. Uh, of providing so a social service, it's less about the technical expertise. 
So you're not looking for, for IT instructors, right? You're looking for people, people, you know, those who are good with people. Um, and those are, so those are the, those are the qualities for the navigator themselves. And then inside the institution, it's an institution that is serving, already serving the population that you want to serve with the digital navigator program. And it, and it, and it's really worked out that way because those entities during the pandemic, those organizations couldn't reach their own missions without also doing digital inclusion work. And, and so that it happened kind of accidentally during the pandemic, but it's really, it's turned out that those are really some of the best places for the digital navigator to be based. Okay, thank you. Can I just add one little thing? I think that that's, um, yeah. So one of the things that we've discovered in Seattle, I'm from Seattle, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> was that, you know, people, so you, they would get devices, you know? So these companies, especially during the pandemic would say, hey, we have 5,000 devices. We just want to, give, we want to donate, you know? And then I'm just like, well, I mean, part of the thing about the lessons in, in this is that, you know, people who organizations, so, so, so social service organizations who are doing this work, were getting these devices and getting them out the door, but then they had to follow up with this digital navigator stuff, you know? Like, how do you use it? And, and you know, the, the more, the more savvy ones were just like, well, that's great that you want to give us 50 devices to give out, but where's the $5,000 we need for our staff to actually follow up with people? But the less savvy are just like, well, oh, thanks, we're going to get them out the door, and then they're inundated with calls, right? And so they had to quickly mobilize to set up this digital navigator type of a <clears throat> toolkit or program, you know, which NDI has been great with creating, with kind of compiling this toolkit like idea, you know, where it's like, this, these are the things you need to know, you know, and so I think that as practitioners, we all know this, but then, you know, as we're working with these, with our, you know, collaborative partners in this work, you know, who, who are the ones helping people to get signed up for other benefits, you know, this is where those people just need, you know, a how-to and where to direct, right, so that they don't have to get, they don't spend two hours looking up a resource that they can just find right away, you know, so I just wanted to add that. On That's there. a great point, Vicki, thank you. So I, I have a question uh, for Angela. Uh, so some states, I think you alluded to this, have formal digital inclusion, I guess I'll say offices or officers or some cities do. And it seems as though there aren't a lot of those, but I'd be interested in your perspective on how many there are. And why do some states, in your opinion, have them and some states don't, because yeah, that's, it, that's, because it seems, yeah. and of course, we're, we're all kind of pretty uh, of a mind here. But it seems like it's something obvious. And and we're from Pennsylvania, so I will say, I am unaware that there is even a statewide office of technology planning. And since IT was my business when I would before I retired, it almost blows my mind that there's no office of technology planning in the state, much less the county. So I'd be interested in your perspective on that. Yes, so Pennsylvania definitely has a broadband office, um, and as Juliet is noting, it has two people in it. So the possibility that one of them could have digital equity as their job when they're overrun with figuring out how to get millions of dollars out is unlikely. Uh, in local governments, um, I mean, you all are lucky, you have Juliet, uh, a lot of, lo most local governments don't. Have anybody to turn to really. I live in Columbus, Ohio. We have the uh, CIO sits in on the coalition meetings, really, because there's nobody else. It's just, how much attention can you get from the CIO on a regular basis? You can't because, you know, he's taking care of everything else in the city. So um, the, our trailblazers, Vicki, would you grab that link too? The trail on, the, on our website, we do track which local governments have digital inclusion activities, one of which that we track is who has an office. So we know who has offices and that's listed there. With the states, there's only one state that we know of that has a whole position for digital equity and that's the state of Washington. Other states have broadband offices, but not a one whole person for digital equity. That's a newer thought. Um, North Carolina has people who do digital equity kind of work kind of wrapped into other positions, that's where we, uh, poached is kind of a harsh word. Let's say we recruited uh, the person from the state of North Carolina to work at NDIA because we needed to do more state level support. And so um, 
the the number of people who actually focus on this at that level is very few. And I think that's why it's so important that for you all to figure out your plan of your offer of assistance to the folks at the state level, because they are, they're like, oh my gosh, one more thing. Now you want us to write a digital equity plan, right? Like we're a little busy. We're a little overwhelmed at the moment. So as much as you can help them with that, and of course guide what it looks like, then um, they're more likely to want to work with you. Can I jump in here? Cause I think this is so important. It's like, I'm like hyper-focused on the state right now, Angela. And um, just because all the money is gonna flow through the states, all of the money, um, it's not coming to municipalities directly. Um, so um, I'm curious, and I, and I just wanna clarify, Angela, that the, um, the sorry, the um, capital projects fund, the ARB capital projects fund is a totally separate fund from the ARP state fiscal recovery. Correct. Yes, completely separate, different rules. Okay, so both That's have quite a bit of broadband money in them, yes. but it is separate. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that because yes, so that's, you that's, were confused that's on That's it. super important and um, highly encourage everybody to read the, the rules. They're not super long, but they are a little heavy. But if you can, to read them and understand when you read them, you're like, kind of seems like they were kind of talking like this. Well, they were, cause they had to fit what they wanted to do inside Congress's language. Uh, but it really is to the benefit of digital inclusion programs, the way the language is written for that capital funds. And that is because the people writing it came from places that understand digital inclusion. So we, we all are very fortunate. The, um are there other, I know you have this sort of list of, of trailblazers, are there other states that kind of a little bit more have their act together um, in terms of having identified some of the larger buckets of how they might spend some funding? Um, so, so I think of Maryland as like my number one because they kind of put right. out a, a plan. Are there others besides Maryland? So the the Trailblazers is focused on local governments only. We have our state digital equity scorecard, which is mostly is about digital literacy at the moment. We're broadening it to include more digital equity, like who has an office. The states of Maryland and New York both have legislation um, specifically uh, identifying money for digital inclusion work. The one in New York is focused on digital navigators and the one in Maryland is broader. Um, the tricky part, and this is totally getting into the weeds, is that those, so those, those bills were passed in those two states. And now a question in New York is, what pot of money does that 15 million come from? And the governor's office is like, it's not, it's not coming from our budget, right? And then there were others at pretty high levels who were like, well, it's not coming from the ARPA money. <laughs> right? And so then their, their state legislature, the guy who got it passed is like, but we passed this, <laughs> we passed, we passed, it's 15 million, uh, right? So like, then it's a question of, well, where then does the money come from? So I think that's the biggest lesson that I learned from that is if you can get some legislation passed, have a clear plan as to which pot of money that's coming from because folks don't always agree. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Speaking of the funding initiatives, I know one issue that we've seen recently is with the, um, is it the ECF? The emergency connectivity funds that the libraries are dealing with right now and the rules around that funding that came out. Do you see any concerns around similar to that with the funding that will be coming out from the uh, infrastructure bill? Um, there was talk for a bit that the uh, reconciliation package, which I know is a I was going to use colorful language, is not a coordinated well effort. Uh, that there could have been more money for ECF in the reconciliation package. I don't 
at this point, that's looking less likely. Um, only 3% of it went to libraries. The rest in that first round went to schools. Um, and as many of you know, that's in large part due to libraries being afraid of the and concerned about the privacy issues and the data collection. Um, so there is another round of money. And in as much as you can convince libraries to dive in, um, I think one of the important points when discussing with them is that right now the FCC is at 2-2. Um, and there's a chance when we get that fifth commissioner that we could um, have some of the requirements adjusted. Uh, that's not a promise. That's just a, we will have potential to do, to ask for changes that we think could really happen. We don't even bother asking right now at 2-2, two, two, they can't get enough done. Two Republicans, two Democrats, sorry. Thanks. Angela, first of all, I just wanna uh, applaud you mightily. If, if you didn't get paid in those early days and worked as hard as you did, it, it, it is the most wonderful organization. For the members of this group, um, is there any kind of demographic homing in that you could suggest where not only for funding, but for attention and advocacy, I know it's been divided up schools, yes. Um, however, if you look at the Pew data, which I think has been pretty consistent, it's rural, it's people of color, mm -hmm. some tribes which are very hard to penetrate with digital literacy um, and seniors, is there, is there any kind of mapping we could do that would help organizations who are hyper-focused on one demographic to uh, secure greater advocacy for themselves and whatever? That's a super good question, Toby. I think what I would recommend is, and I loved hearing that you guys are working on, uh, that you're in the process of your mini strategic planning, of creating a plan of here are the target, here are what our recommendations for target populations based upon the data. And the reason that that's important is because you could then give that to the state to say, here's how we want you to spend that money. And we, this coalition has jointly agreed. So it's coming from, how many organizations did you say? <laughs> like it's coming from X number of organizations, right? So like, and then getting others to sign on to that, like become, making that very much a community recommendation to the state on how they spend their money. And I have to say, Toby has been part of NDIA since the very beginning, which is pretty super. So I have another question, uh, and this is really more just your opinion, and I will not use the word- I got if, lots of those. Yeah, I will not use the word if, I will use the word when. Okay. When do you think, I guess the FCC, I don't know, will acknowledge that the internet is an essential part of life and should be a public utility treated just like water, electricity, and other things. And when that happens, what will the role be or where do the ISPs then fit in if that, when that happens? Yeah. Um, I don't think I have your uh, strength of conviction on the when. Come on. I know, I know. Um, I do think there, we've already experienced an adjustment, right? We've already experienced an adjustment of Internet service providers having, they still have a lot of power, don't get me wrong, but it's been tempered a bit during the pandemic. There's been an awareness that they're not just taking care of it as they have told policymakers for forever. Like when you saw, we saw all those photos of the kids sitting in the Taco Bell parking lot, clearly you're not taking care of it because that's not okay. So getting to a a regulatory structure where um, they are required to do things, it's not gonna jump straight to they're all super regulated. Um, it's gonna be that middle ground where we're gonna keep making gains and making gains. We're gonna, it's gonna be a struggle for a long time. Um, and I think where we're at right now is that we have made some gains. Uh, the emergency broadband benefit 
$50 a month, even when it drops to $30 a month after we have the infrastructure bill, that's still amazing, right? And we did that with the internet service providers because they realized they had to be part of the solution and not just be part of the problem. Um, we are now able, I think, to be able to start putting more pressure on the internet service providers to, um, to improve. And Comcast does have the best low cost offer out there. Um, I live in spectrum territory. I would much prefer internet essentials over what spectrum offers for their low cost offer. It's just crap friends. So, um, and they don't do any promotion around it, whatever. They don't even have staff who are dedicated to that. <laughs> At least Comcast has staff who are dedicated to internet essentials. That's, that's huge. So I think that's the kind of pressure we can keep putting on all of them. The other change I think is around who owns the infrastructure and more projects where it is, um, where there's local accountability whether it's a whether it's a for profit or a nonprofit, even smaller for profits that where you know the owners live locally, the owner the right AT and T is based in Texas, right, and I'm in Ohio. So, you know that's the kind of kind of there's no local accountability really. So I do think we're making progress heading towards a shift in the broadband industry. Is it where it needs to be? No, we're not even close. And it's going to be a struggle for a long time. Thank you. And, and, and to note, because I think you all are in the same boat, we have to still work with the internet service providers, right? Like they know how I talk about them and they still talk to me, <laughs> right? I think that was the biggest amazement I had when, when we started NDIA that I could be like, hey, here's a reality. Uh, and then I could still have a relationship with internet service providers because I'm just, we're just transparent. Like we just want what's best for communities. And sometimes that means working with the internet service providers and sometimes it's telling them what they're doing wrong. This is a great discussion. We have just a few minutes left. Um, I know Kate is having some trouble with Zoom. So I'm gonna try and do some more facilitation here myself. So, uh, so in the last few minutes, is there any who have questions or even clarity about some of the questions? Maybe you didn't know some of the terms that were being used that maybe we can clarify, but. Um, anyone have questions that you want to ask Angela, even or to the groups, even for TLC or to uh, Dip NJ, if you have questions about kind of next steps or things that are going happening? We're a small group. Feel free just to unmute and talk. That's fine. So. Yeah, thanks, Juliet, for posting that in the chat. And, and thanks to Juliet. Juliet was a star this morning on FCC's uh, live stream. So uh, great job on that panel this morning, Juliet, representing Philadelphia. Thanks, Andy. Thanks to TLC for hosting this awesome event and everybody for joining. Um, we're lucky in Philadelphia. I think we're really lucky that we have like a, a network of you all who come out and, and are doing incredible work. So. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I guess my, my last pitch is uh, if you're not already a member of NDIA, join. It's free. Uh, then you can get the listserv, change it to digest if you need to. Uh, the newsletter, right? Join our community calls. Because it's also a matter of hearing your voice. It's not just what you would get from that, but it's what you can lend to the full conversation. This is really a movement. And you all are at the forefront of this movement. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say I, I've appreciated that, especially being on the Digital Navigator working groups, just the collaboration there. It's, it's it's NDA is leading things, but it's all collaboration. Like, here's a document we need to help, you know, draft this thing. Can everyone jump in and help us do this? Or maybe a state or, or a city has been doing something and they want help. Everyone can jump in and help. And that becomes, a, a, you know, a template for other people to use. Um, yeah, so those working groups are, are excellent. So but thank you, Angela, for taking time to be with us today. And uh it's great. It's, I love the, um, the conversation and the question back and forth. And this, this is great. Um, I'll just say for TLC, uh, look forward for us. We're going to be having starting up our monthly webinars again. Hopefully you'll see one towards the end of October announcement from us. And um, and I believe, uh, Andrew, I believe you have for DipNJ, there is another webinar this week, you said, right? 
Yep, there's one more. We're having our annual symposium tomorrow. I'll put the link uh, in the chat again, uh, just if anyone missed it. And thanks, Angela, and thanks, uh, TLC Philly. This, this is really, really great. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for all the New Jersey participants and, uh, and our TLC family coming out and supporting this. We really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to hear, keep hearing from everyone. And we will keep everyone updated as well, especially on the status of our nonprofit, nonprofit status and some of the workshops and um, that we'll be able to, we'll, we'll be doing soon. So awesome. Thank thanks you. to everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. And take care, everyone.